These brothers that we hear about in our first reading were willing to lose their lives, and they did so for refusing to break the rules of their religion. Indeed, we are told they accepted torture and death rather than eat just a piece of bacon or a bit of sausage. On reflection, maybe this seems a bit extreme to us, but this is the line that they drew in the sand and the line that they would not cross because they felt that breaking even one law, insignificant as that might seem, would undermine the whole law. Looking ahead several centuries from that time, we can to this very day visit the remnants of a Christian church not far from the Nile in Egypt, near the site of the ancient city of Thebes, a church that was built on the foundations of a Roman temple. The altar of this church is placed over the spot where during the persecutions conducted by the emperors Nero and Domitian, countless Christians were asked simply to say this one sentence, Caesar is Lord. Admittedly, many crossed their fingers behind their backs and stated this, just that they might spare their own lives. But many more, with faith and courage, stood up and said, Jesus is Lord, and so they perished. What we might ask allowed the mother and the seven brothers in our first reading to accept death for their beliefs, What motivated those who became martyrs throughout the Roman world in the early years of the church's existence to lay down their lives for a just cause, a noble principle, for their religious belief? The answer seems simply belief in life beyond death. This is indeed evident in the responses of the brothers as they met their deaths. For each one trusts that he states, as he states, that God will give him life. The God who gave it to him here will restore it hereafter. Certainly the image of a crown, the symbol of victory, which was so often inscribed on the tombs of the first martyrs, also gives evidence of an unshakable belief in the resurrection among our earliest ancestors in the Christian faith. The gospel reveals that even in Jesus' day, belief in life after death was questioned by some, in particular the Sadducees. Yet in response to their efforts to trap Jesus and trip him up, Jesus speaks with greatest certainty of the resurrected life, assuring his listeners that life in the world to come will not be business or even relationships as usual, but a new life altogether. Jesus, of course, would provide the greatest evidence for this resurrected life when his tomb would be found empty and he would be seen alive by his disciples for 40 days after Easter. As our church enters the month of November, our focus naturally turns toward death as we observe the month of remembrance of the faithful departed. Yet as the old rhyme goes, as we are now, so once were they. As they are now, so we shall be. Though not completely out of the realm of possibility in this age of fundamentalist extremism, it is still unlikely that we in the West will be threatened with loss of life for our beliefs. Yet, 
If we were, would we be ready to accept martyrdom? Or would we be more likely to eat the pork or cross our fingers behind our back as we betray our beliefs? Yet whether our lives are in, the, in peril in the hands of extremists or we find ourselves in the safety of our own homes, the important question for all of us to confront is how afraid are we of death? As we hear St. Luke's Gospel today, Jesus is certainly inviting us to let go of our fears of what lies beyond what we presently know. For although life will be changed, Jesus is assuring us absolutely that it will not be ended. So let us pray that faith in the resurrection among us will be deepened. For only when we have overcome our fear of death are we truly free to live our faith with courage and no matter the circumstances, to die in peace.